You may be seated. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for your holy scripture. This day that we have read and heard. And we ask that in the spirit, we might retain your truth in our hearts and our minds. And in the moments to come, may the words which are spoken and thoughts and meditations in each and every heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. There's an old saying, where there's smoke. Years ago, I had an opportunity to go to Lake Junaluska for a continuing education time. There was a half day that I was going to spend going to the Pisgah National Forest where the Appalachian Trail goes through, and there's a spot called Max Patch. It's hard to find, but once you get there, it's a beautiful hill to climb, and it's a meadow when you get on top and you can see views for miles around. I was going to take some books there and something to write with and spend a, an afternoon on a hillside looking at the views, reading, and writing. When I got there, it was beautiful, but as not as beautiful as it should have been because there was a haze in the air. There was a smokiness. And as I got up on top and looked out over the vista, there was a haze throughout all of the mountains. Beautiful, but not like it had been that I had seen before. But nonetheless, I found a spot and I began to read and study a little bit. But it became, I quickly realized that I wasn't going to be able to stay because of the smoke that was in the air. It began to make me feel nauseated and I knew I had to leave. I couldn't see what was causing the smoke. But I knew that there was a fire somewhere because where there's smoke, there's fire. And sure enough, some 40 miles away, some youth had accidentally left a campfire unattended, and it had gotten out of control and was burning thousands of acres in the Appalachians, and the smoke had drifted that far and was affecting that many people that far away. A smoke, or a fire, can be a devastating thing. And it's hard to understand when they're started on purpose. The effects of the fire can be devastating. It burns everything in its way. Today, Jesus in the gospel gives a warning about a coming fire. But the thing that's the hardest to understand is that Jesus said that it's a fire he's going to start. It's an act of holy arson. And we need to be prepared. Israel had hoped for a day when God would send a Messiah to restore Israel back to its former glory under Kings David and Solomon. We know what it's like to look back and wish for the glory days, don't we? Football season's about to start here in SEC country. And, and we all have our teams and we remember our glory days, right? Ole Miss fans remember a coach named Johnny Vaughn, right? Arkansas fans remember a Frank Boyles. Georgia remembers those days of Vince Dooley. Tennessee remembers General Nalen and later Phil Fulmer. Florida fans are always going to remember that guy named Spurrier. Seems like Alabama has never not had a glory year. Saban's done wonderful things, and there used to be some other guy down there years ago. Israel. Look forward to that old glory, to when David and Solomon's kingdoms were the envy of the world. And Jesus said, do you think I've come to bring peace? And that word that we translate peace is a Greek word that means communal peace and prosperity. Do you think I've come to restore Israel to its former glory? To get rid of the Romans? To 
to establish Israel's greatness? You got it all wrong, he was telling the people. I'm here to bring God's fire. Jesus had been telling the people to get ready for God's kingdom. He had been, just previous to the verses we heard today, been warning the people to be ready for the coming of the, of the Master. For one day, he said, the Master will return and will hopefully find his servants being faithful. But if not, there will be a judgment. And in that vein, Jesus says the words we heard today, I've come to bring a fire, and, and I wish it were already kindled. The Old Testament was full of stories that compared God's action and God's word to fire. Once Jeremiah called out, Hear the word of the Lord. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let the one who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat is not my word like fire, says the Lord God. In Isaiah, there's a place that we read, One of the seraphs flew to me, said Isaiah, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar of fire with a pair of tongs. And the seraph touched my mouth with the coal and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed you. Your sin is blotted out. And I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Isaiah had seen the seraphim coming to him with that coal from the fire. He touched his lips and then say, Whom shall I send? Notice that only after God's fire touched him was he worthy to say, Here am I, send me. When God led Israel out of slavery of Egypt, God said to the people, Be careful, be careful not to forget the covenant that the Lord your God made with you, and not to make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything that the Lord your God has forbidden. For the Lord your God is a devouring fire, a jealous God. In 1 Kings is the story about Elijah on Mount Carmel in a contest with the prophets of Baal. Elijah built an altar and he prays this prayer, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all of these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that the people will know that you are God and that you have turned their hearts back to you. And the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the offering. This was the fire of God's word. The Bible also tells us that Jesus was the Word of God made flesh and reminds us that God's Word is a fire. And thus Jesus tells the people in the Scripture today, I have come to bring a fire. John Wesley wrote about this Scripture. And he was convinced that what we understand about this fire has to be from the lens of understanding the love of Jesus Christ. So even in the midst of words of warning from Jesus, Wesley would remind us that it comes from Christ's very love that was heading to the cross in order to save us. So in the context of the love of Christ, in the context of all that Christ has done in his love, in his mercy. How do we understand this fire that Christ said he was starting? Because one thing we understand about fire is that fire can destroy. Jesus in the Gospels often spoke about the fire and the judgment of God. From time to time in the Gospels, Jesus even mentions the fires of hell. But in those times that our Bible translates Jesus talking about the fires of hell, each time Jesus used the word in Greek, Gehenna, to refer to the place of judgment. 
In point of fact, Gehenna was an actual place on the edge of Jerusalem. It was on the southeast side. It was a valley on the southeast side where all of the trash was placed and burned. In other words, Jesus was comparing the place of judgment and comparing the sin of the people to something that belongs in the garbage, where the fires always burn and the worm never dies. Friends, are there things in your life that are not worthy to hold? Are there things in your mind and in your heart that do not belong in the minds and the hearts of children of God? Why hold on to those things in your life? You know, the Forest Service often will start a fire in order to clean the floor of the forest. In that way, room is made for new life to grow. In the same way, some things of this world have to be burned away to allow, to allow new life. And in the same way, we should always allow for the Spirit to be a fire of repentance in our lives. In Isaiah's passage that we heard earlier in the service, God speaks a word of judgment against Israel. God compared Israel to a vineyard that he had loved, that he had carefully planted and built a wall around to guard. Yet God announced in Isaiah's passage today that he was tearing down the wall of protection, and that he was not going to prune it anymore, and that God was going to allow briars to grow in the vineyard. The reason? God said because he expected justice, but he saw bloodshed. God expected righteousness, but he heard the cry of the people. Today, Jesus says to the people gathered around him, I've come to bring a fire. And he said it to Israel, to God's chosen people, Jesus said that. It should make us pause to consider our own nation and our own society. How much more will God's fire judge our nation if we forsake the Lord? Suffice it to say, we know what's right and wrong. We're reminded in Hebrews that we heard today that we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses to look forward to their faithfulness. But remember, that cloud of witnesses spoken of in Hebrews were faithful before they even knew Christ. We know Christ. And the author of Hebrews tells us that we will have a greater responsibility of faithfulness. Before we ever point a finger at culture and at society, remember that whenever you point at something, there's always fingers pointing back at you. We should always first look at ourselves, look at our own hearts, Evaluate our own mind and soul. Beware. Beware of haughty attitudes. Beware of unrighteous actions. Beware of selfishness. Beware of neglecting the poor. Those are things that are temporary that are not helpful, that belong in the fires of the trash dump. But fire, we know, also refines things that are durable. Sometimes, sometimes, adversity in life can be like a fire, can't it? There's an old saying that pressure in one's life produces character. I think it's closer to the truth to say that pressure in one's life reveals character. We all know of people who undergo tremendous adversity and it may take a toll on the body and mind, and the body and mind may be affected, but we find that the person's spirit is perfected. 
Under fire, gold is revealed from the ore. Under fire, diamonds are revealed from the coal. Under fire, glass is revealed from the sand. In the same way, the fruits of the Spirit are revealed in the fire of God. One's life is full of the Spirit, has no need to fear the fire. For the fire only refines that which is durable. Malcolm Muggeridge was a noted British journalist, author, and Christian scholar. Once he said in an interview, contrary to my, my white, pardon me, contrary to what might be expected, I look back on experiences that at the time seemed especially desolating and painful, and I look upon them with particular satisfaction. Indeed, he said, I could say with complete truthfulness that everything I have learned in my 75 years in this world, everything that has truly enhanced and enlightened my experience, has been learned through affliction and not through happiness. Fire refines those things that are durable. And fire can clarify our priorities. If there was a fire, what would you do? What would you try to save? You would try to save that which was most valuable to you. Perhaps your loved one. As Jesus says in the gospel today that he's starting a fire, and we hear that spoken in the spirit to us today, we, like the people that first heard it, have to make a decision. What do you do? Who do you try to say? What do you try to say? Remember the scripture from Joshua, when Joshua spoke to the people of Israel and he told the people of Israel, now, if you're unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. There's an old story told about an old country church where there was a man who was completely deaf. And he went to church faithfully every Sunday, even though there was no sign language for translation for him. There was no way that he could hear a word that was being said or sung. But every Sunday, he was there. And one day, one of his non-church acquaintances asked him why he went every Sunday to church, even though he couldn't hear a thing that was being said. The deaf man read the note that the friend had passed him that asked the question, and he answered by writing back, I don't want there to be any doubt on whose side I'm on. Christ has set a fire. What are your priorities? Not everybody will agree. Christ knew that even families would be divided over him and his word. Father against son, mother against daughter. But that should make us even more aware of the importance of love and support in your family. The fire of Christ's love is a saving thing, and our families are the biggest opportunities to share Christ's love. Now, one other thing needs to be made clear. Judgment belongs to God. The fire belongs to Christ. No one else. Years ago, Cordova was way out in the country. And when we first moved there, when I was growing up, we, in the autumn, would always have a weekend where we'd rake leaves and we would burn the leaves. One year, we were burning leaves as normal when we heard sirens in the distance. We were embarrassed when the sirens got louder and louder and stopped at our driveway. The fire trucks had come, and they told us that from now on there was a new rule. You had to have a permit to burn a fire. Friends, there's no permit for the church. There's no permit for any individuals. There's no permit for you, for me 
to judge any person. That is God's purview. And the only one permitted to start the fire is Christ himself. And ultimately, the fire started by Christ began on the cross. As God said in the passage from Isaiah that we heard today, as he described Israel as a vineyard that he had loved, that he had guarded, that he had protected, God said to Israel, what more could God have done? And in the same way, we could ask the same question as we recognize what Christ has done upon the cross. What more could Christ have done? Immediately after saying that Christ was starting a fire, he said he had a distressing baptism to come, meaning the cross itself. The fire of God's word led him directly to the cross. And it was at the cross he died for your sins and mine. It was at the cross that he perfectly was obedient unto death. It was there at the cross he reconciled humanity to God and where our sin was nailed to the very cross where he died. What more could he have done? So it is in Christ's love. It's in Christ's love where the judgment is found. In the shadow of that cross. In the judgment of that love. What will your decision be for Christ? The fire's coming. The fire of God's word. A fire of Christ's love. Which by its very nature judges this world. A fire that purifies that which is holy. A fire that makes us decide once and for all what is of eternal value. A holy fire that does all of that and much, much more, but make no mistake, Jesus has already said it. An act of holy arson. And he said it on the cross. It brings judgment. But the Bible reminds us that the judgment is this. That the light came into the world. And the world chose the darkness. You smell that? You smell smoke? You know what they say, where there's smoke, there's fire. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our final hymn is found on 578, God of Love and God of Power. As we sing our final hymn of praise, if there are any here this day that would need time for prayer or conversation following the worship service, there will be a Stephen minister standing by the banner to my left. As we remember all that Christ has done for us, the fire of God's word that has been set into your heart and mind, let us sing with all faith the song at the end and go forth from this place in the fire of that spirit. Let us stand. Thank you.